Good afternoon and welcome to live coverage of the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery and the first live nationwide high definition digital broadcast from Florida's Kennedy Space Center. For Harris Corporation, I'm Mary Alice Williams along with former astronaut Pete Conrad and we are standing by for the liftoff of STS-95. NASA says everything is a go for this liftoff that is scheduled to go at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. Weather, the most tricky variable in the launch sequence at this time, has cleared up to severe clear, and NASA's giving it 100%. That's correct. Right now, all the astronauts are strapped inside the orbiter, the Discovery. Yes, they're all uh, in place, and it's been closed out, and they're in their final count. The strapping down process is surprisingly difficult because they have to strap down arms and legs, anything that during the vibration of liftoff is going to bump into an essential toggle switch or something, right? Right, and uh, you do get a little bit of a, a rough ride going out uh, till you get to the really higher altitudes or, or out, of, uh, out of the atmosphere, actually, and so... They're well strapped in. They also are wearing parachutes, and so they've got their suits and their parachutes, and everything has to be put in the right place and tied down. Those are 90-pound flight suits with cooling tubes in them to keep them cool during this long stretch while they're just laying on their backs waiting to go, right? Right, and that's uh, not too different than what we wore on the moon, although we didn't launch with the water-cooled underwear. We uh, put it on when we got to the moon and used it down there. So they're using the same things we use. Well, this will be the 92nd flight of the space uh, shuttle, but it's far from routine, of course, because the lowliest uh, payload expert is the stuff of American lore. It was 1962 when Americans were looking up and seeing beyond the range of our vision. It was the birth of the American space program. On February 20th, a military test pilot named John Glenn boarded the Friendship 7, a space capsule so small it said he didn't so much climb into it as strap it on, and he became the first American to orbit the Earth. His uh, mission in the Mercury space capsule lasted just under five hours. It was a technological triumph. It was also a political coup in the Cold War-driven race for space. And it was perhaps politics as well that kept Glenn grounded for the next 36 years. After his three orbits around the Earth, Glenn's heroism burned so brightly that the Commander-in-Chief, President John F. Kennedy, deemed the danger of sending Glenn on another high-stakes flight too great a risk to the entire space program. Glenn quit the astronaut corps two years after his Mercury flight, but his hunger for the frontier of space never waned. After lobbying NASA and working the policy and politics of both the space program and the Senate Committee on Aging, the 77-year-old senator from Ohio becomes the oldest person ever to go into space. Now, Pete Conrad was Glenn's understudy back in 1962. As a Gemini astronaut, he helped establish space endurance and altitude records. He was commander of Apollo 12 the second uh, lunar landing, and he was commander of Skylab 1, the first United States space station. Pete, I'm honored to be sitting next to you, sir. You've been one of my heroes for a long time. Tell me, what might they be feeling right now strapped in there? Well, you're getting down to knowing this is not a drill, and this is going to be <laughs> the real McCoy. So uh, we're all human, and I suspect that they're getting their uh, juices up a little bit getting ready for their big ride. Do they have pre-flight jitters or are they so focused on what they're about to do? Well, I can't speak for them, but uh, obviously uh, I used to worry about what was gonna happen the night before. That's why I was always sound asleep in the middle of the count because I hadn't really rested the <laughs> night before. But uh, I think what you will find is they're down there uh, being all business, especially the crew commander and the, and the pilot because uh, the rest of them don't have that much duties right now. You know, Glenn never stopped dreaming of this moment, and it's safe to say he's pumped. 
uh, David Crabtree of WRALHD in Raleigh, North Carolina, got Glenn on his favorite subject. Hey, the we would be Rick, you promise. Good Lord, ride all the way. If God speed, John Glenn. With those words, it was finally time to go. America watched and cheered as Friendship 7 blasted off the launch pad and began to rewrite the history books. But on the first flight, I was very apprehensive, and I think all of us on those first flights were. Were you aware of every little creak and shudder that went on that you heard or noise that didn't sound quite right? Or Maybe some apprehension, but never fear. After riding a pillar of fire, the capsule was in orbit. It was quiet inside Friendship 7, very quiet. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, every time this hero's heart would beat, he traveled another four miles. Your, your vantage point is something that you've never, when you're going around the Earth, is, is uh, like none you've ever had before. I was up about 167 miles. After he safely returned to Earth, Glenn was eager to share that experience with as many people as possible. Within days, he met with the president, then addressed a joint session of Congress. Glenn knew what he had accomplished was truly special. But like other great pioneers before him, it took a while for it to really sink in. I think the American people sort of saw our success there and our openness. It was sort of a, it was the beginning of our real comeback in this area. and, and uh, I think it, it had such an outpouring of spirit after that, ticker tape parades, and people like you just couldn't imagine the, the attention that uh, came to us and to all of us in the Mercury program, and me in particular. For the past several months, Glenn has split his time between his Senate duties in Washington and training at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. When Discovery lifts off, payload specialist two, John Glenn, will have trained for 500 grueling hours just for this mission. At 77, he brings more to the mission than just flight time. You know, we have 34 million Americans over 65 right now. And uh, that's due to triple over the next 50 years. Looking at ultraviolet, we'll be looking at all these other things. We'll be looking at an osteo experiment on board that I'll be conducting or be doing some work on that, on uh, uh, osteoporosis and how the, the bone cells uh, work to come together. There will be other jobs during the nine-day mission, such as ultraviolet experiments, cardiovascular research for the elderly, and placing a small satellite into orbit. While Glenn is in space, he knows there will be critics here on Earth, those who say this is only a publicity stunt for NASA. He acknowledges this has turned out to be a shot in the arm for the space program, but much more is at stake. We have 83 different research projects on this one flight. I think it'll be one of the most, uh, probably the most research-rich flight uh, that's ever gone up out of NASA. In 1962, Glenn rode in a metal can that inside felt no larger than a refrigerator. The shuttle is 10 times that size. Roger, EPI is... But some of the elements are the same no matter what the size, especially the moments just before liftoff. You look up and you see the, the uh, condensation trails coming off of it in the wind and the lights on it and uh, all of that. And you, uh, you've trained for that, you look forward to it, and it's a real thrill to be there and look up. It's like, like nothing else you can do. Technology has changed radically in the three and a half decades since uh, Glenn made that historic journey. But uh, the equipment that heads for space today isn't the only thing that's undergone big advances in technology. The very TV signal that you're now watching is ushering in a new era for television broadcasting. David Waterman tells why it'll be the most dramatic change since color hit the screen 44 years ago. The, the spacesuits that uh, they were wearing on the moon, and you're looking at the 1998 version now, is, uh, have undergone changes, but they're not as radical as one would have expected, Pete. The, uh, on 
was listening to the count there. That's going very well again. And uh, uh, the suits are uh, considerably different than the ones we used on the moon um, for obvious reasons. These suits are strictly for them to uh, be able to bail out at uh, high altitude. And uh, our suits uh, had a much more stringent environment that they had to keep us alive in. So um, they were a little bit more complicated. Your, your suits were right. concerned with your survival. Right, and we also had to carry the backpack, which was our life support system when we were out on the lunar surface. How many pounds was that? Well, all told, about 150 pounds. And I weighed about 150 pounds, so we did our training in uh, 1G, and so we were in really good shape, and when we got up there on the moon, we really only weighed 50 pounds. Okay, we're going to go back to David Waterman's report on high-definition television. Conventional TV signals now are analog, sent at certain wavelengths. Digital TV handles data similar to a computer. Each element on the screen is converted to a flow of tiny ones and zeros. More detail can be reduced for transmission, resulting in a sharper, high-definition picture. Plus, digital television makes it possible to transmit multiple standard-definition programs all on the same channel at the same time, and all high definition as well as standard definition with high quality compact disc surround sound audio. In addition to a picture four to five times as sharp, there's more of it. New high definition TV sets will allow viewers to see about 33% more of the action taking place at a sporting event, concert, or movie. In fact, it's shaped more like a movie screen. The new format also allows other information to be sent by the TV signal. Digital television offers the opportunity to transmit vast quantities of data data that might be internet material associated with a program, or commercial data used for raising revenues for individual stations. Which could include home services such as bank and investment statements, and interaction with viewers. The Federal Communications Commission has mandated this technology change for all the nation's TV stations by the middle of 2003 to help preserve free, over-the-air broadcast signals. Next month, over 40 broadcasters across the country will begin broadcasting in high definition. And by this time next year, over 50% of all consumers will have access to at least three digital high definition channels. A big transformation for television broadcasting and the seven astronauts waiting to begin the 25th flight of the shuttle Discovery will also see quite a change in their lifestyle over the next nine days. Glenn, of course, has been the headliner on this flight. In fact, um, he carries the lowly rank of payload specialist. When we return, we're going to be meeting the rest of the crew. Harris Corporation's live digital high definition coverage of the launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery. Conditions are looking just perfect as we are in well, about 46 minutes away from the actual launch of STS-95 mission. Pete Conrad has been monitoring NASA Select and what can we expect? Situation's normal. They've just updated the altimeter and the latest winds for them for their launch conditions and completed some more uh, air to ground comm checks and uh, things are progressing right by the book. The winds are an important uh, variable here because if there's a problem on this launch, they have a return to landing site right here at the Kennedy Space Center. But if the winds are as low as 17 miles an hour, cross winds over that runway, they can't land this, this bird here. Right, right. That's uh, a crosswind limitation. You said the right thing and uh, it's okay for today. Things are looking good. The wind's right where it's supposed to be. Later on in the program, I want to talk to you about trying to land this thing with no power. But right now, we're being told that there will be a hold at 20 minutes to launch for about 10 minutes. That is normal? That they is expected normal. to do it's that? That is normal. built-in hold. And, uh, and when they come out of that, they're getting really serious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John Glenn orbited the Earth alone on that historic 1962 flight of his Mercury capsule. And the United States government back then didn't invite much international involvement in the space program, to say the least. This time it's a global effort. 
When the uh, shuttle Discovery roars off the launch pad this afternoon, Glenn will be one of seven people on board. His crewmates include a Japanese doctor and a Spaniard from the European Space Agency. Commanding the mission will be a seasoned shuttle veteran and Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who reveres Glenn, but who has admitted to wondering about leading a mission everyone's labeled the Glenn Flight. <laughs> Till his mother reportedly scolded, just remember who you're flying with. WRAL's HD's David Crabtree checked out Commander Kurt Brown. Elizabeth Town, North Carolina. Population 4,000. One of its most famous, maybe its most famous native, Lieutenant Colonel Kurt Brown, shuttle commander. He placed Elizabeth Town on the map, so to speak, and we are quite prou proud of his accomplishments, and uh, we know that there will be many more for him. She's right. The next accomplishment, commander of the Space Shuttle Discovery, with crew member, senior citizen astronaut John Glenn. This is his fifth flight, and uh, it's a, he was a flight commander on the last flight he was on and, and uh, is one of their most experienced astronauts at NASA now, so it's, a real, it's an honor for me to be flying with him. And flying has been Commander Brown's life for 25 years. This is the runway at the airport in Elizabethtown, 5,000 feet of asphalt. Pretty nice. Small jets land here. But it wasn't always that way. When Kurt Brown learned to fly and soloed and touched down, the airstrip was actually grass. But he said that didn't matter because as long as he can remember, he's always wanted to fly. That was my whole goal in life was to, uh, to be a pilot, to fly airplanes, uh, just to fly. And fly he has. First as a private pilot while he was a student at East Bladen High School in North Carolina, then the Air Force Academy. Finally, as astronaut Kurt Brown. As a veteran of shuttle missions, Brown has orbited the Earth hundreds of times, but says the view is never boring. The words can't really, can't really describe it. It's uh, just the broadness of it, the vastness of it, the beauty of it, the Earth there below you, and, and you're seeing something that only a few hundred people in the whole history of, of mankind or humankind has ever seen. Uh, you're having that chance to see that. Now he has the chance to do something different. Command a crew that includes 77-year-old John Glenn, who made history when Commander Kurt Brown was just a boy. What were you, six or seven, when John Glenn made his three orbits around the Earth? Well, six-ish, I would say, somewhere <laughs> along there. Do you remember that? Well, I remember, uh, I don't remember the, the actual event. Well, I don't, I'm not sure we had a television at that time growing up, but I do remember the newspapers and uh, uh, the front page had the big bold and, and the photos, and I know I remember talking to uh, my father about that stuff. Is there more pressure in leading this mission with the world's most famous and oldest astronaut on board? Actually, if you know, you're know you older, you're older. I mean, that's just physics. And uh, uh, sure, I was concerned that he was 77, but uh, a lot of the medical community, the folks that, that actually say whether I'm qualified or whether he's qualified or any of the crew members are qualified to go fly, they, they send him through a whole battery, battery of tests, and uh, he passed all those with flying color. So uh, from my standpoint as commander, He's been certified to go fly, and, and I don't worry too much about that. And payload specialist, too, John Glenn, is equally as content. Kurt, as our commander, is uh, he's really doing a good job in, in making sure that everybody is trained and we're all ready to go. With or without John Glenn, the shuttle missions have made Kurt Brown a rising star at NASA, and along the way, he's never forgotten his heritage back on Earth. My, my parents and all the folks back home that helped me uh, stay uh, stay in school and stay smart and stay uh, you know make the right decisions those are the folks that deserve a lot of that credit he hasn't forgotten them and they have never forgotten him still those hometown values and hometown pride and uh, uh, always giving a wonderful message to our student body that you can be whatever you want to be and he is a local hero isn't he? he certainly is he is our hometown hero Brown has logged 977 hours in space compared to Glenn's five, but that's only one of the contrasts among the crew. This will be the first space flight for one member. Most of the crew were toddlers. One wasn't even born yet when Glenn made his first flight in 1962. And their backgrounds include a cardiovascular surgeon, a former Olympic team coach, and of course, U.S. Senator. 
38-year-old Stephen Lindsay will be Discovery's pilot, the same job he performed on his first shuttle flight last November. The Air Force Lieutenant Colonel has spent plenty of time in the cockpit, logging 3,300 hours of flight in 50 different types of aircraft. 37-year-old flight engineer Scott Parazinski, making his third shuttle trip, has helped design exercise devices used for extended space flight. He trained to go aboard Russia's Mir space station, but that was finally ruled out. He was too tall. In med school, he was on the U.S. development luge team and ranked among the nation's top 10 competitors during the 1988 Olympic trials. He was an Olympic team coach for the Philippines in the 88 Winter Games. Mission specialist Stephen Robinson just celebrated his 44th birthday Monday. He's making his second shuttle flight. He's been a NASA research scientist in such fields as aerodynamics and fluid dynamics. His previous shuttle experience includes work with the robotic arm and satellite deployment and retrieval, which he'll be involved with this trip. 35-year-old Pedro Duque is one of the two international crew members this mission and the only rookie. He was born in Madrid, Spain. The astronaut with the European Space Agency also trained in Russia for a possible visit to Mir, but never made the trip. He's helped develop models to determine spacecraft orbits and software to compute them. This mission also has an international flavor, thanks to an astronaut with the National Space Development Agency of Japan. She's making her second shuttle flight. She's 46-year-old Chiaki Mukai who first flew on sister ship Columbia in July of 1994. Not only was Mukai the first Japanese woman to go into orbit, but she brings along some impressive medical credentials. David Waterman has details. Mukai is board certified as a cardiovascular surgeon and has performed lengthy research on the heart as well. In 1985, she heard the Japanese space agency was looking for a science astronaut to conduct experiments aboard the space shuttle. There was, of course, material science experiment as well as life science and medical related experiment. So I felt that this, is, this was my great opportunity to use my expertise to contribute to the space program and to go into orbit. She'll never forget the first time she saw the Earth from a different perspective. Well, that was beautiful and so, well, actually amazingly beautiful and very elegant. And I felt that I was very much proud of being a part of the member who live on this such a beautiful uh, blue planet. Mm. For the past 13 years, Mukai has split her time between Tokyo and Houston. She's described as very serious about her work, but she knows how to laugh, too. You have no Texas accent in your English. Well, <laughs> maybe I can say you all. <laughs> Howdy. <laughs> no hat, no boots, I see. <laughs> well, I have uh, the cowboy hat and the cowboy boots. <laughs> and I really like Houston, because people are so friendly. Mukai will be good friends with Glenn on this flight. The two payload specialists will oversee nearly a do seven dozen experiments on board. That health and science research may have a profound impact not only on future space exploration, but on the long-term future of us humans here on Earth. When we come back, a look at what's in the test tubes aboard the world's most sophisticated and high-flying laboratory. DTV Express is bringing the experience of digital broadcasting to television stations around the nation. Hi, everybody. On behalf of the Harris Corporation and PBS, I'd like to welcome you all to the DTV Express this afternoon. Broadcasters have asked us for our help in making a smooth transition to digital television, and the Harris PBS DTV Express is the kind of program that can do just that. Inform broadcasters, enlighten educators and government policymakers, and most importantly, show the American people the remarkable new capabilities and services made possible by digital television. Harris and PBS are working together to make the DTV Express the source for information and education about the transition to digital television. With examples of the programs and services that people are going to see in their homes in the near future. 
Our partnership with the Harris Corporation and the DTV Express Project provided a perfect opportunity to inform our member stations and the broadcast community about the opportunities presented by DTV. DTV Express has helped me understand what's going on as far as the transmission. It's shown us the uh, several different options available in the equipment that we will need and it lays it out in a very simple and straightforward manner that uh, any engineer can understand. The new digital television system is literally tailor-made for broadcasters. Good morning and welcome to the DTV Express Business Seminar. DTV Express seminars are packed with the latest information from technical to business curriculum materials. Harris Corporation has a long-standing tradition of educating broadcasters about the latest in broadcast technologies. The DTV Express is by far our largest and most comprehensive initiative of this sort to date. The DTV seminars that uh, the Harris and PBS have been presenting has helped give me uh, an idea of what directions my station should go in preparing for digital TV. Because of the number of people that we have, we're offering two courses, Bitstream Encoding at 10 a.m., or RF Transmission Measurement at 9, and following both classes is a tour of the DTV truck. Look at another city and all these people just waiting to experience digital television. I love it. Anyone that's in the engineering departments at any station, if they have the opportunity to attend these seminars, need to. This is very, very enlightening. PBS invite you to learn more about DTV Express and digital television by visiting our website at www.dtvexpress.org. We're back with Harris Corporation's live digital HD TV coverage of the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. The latest on the countdown is the following. We're in a hold. We're in the 10-minute the, uh, hold, hold, hold that we... Yeah. We told them about just a few minutes ago, and what's going on now? Actually, the built-in hole's about 20 minutes long, and we're about 10 minutes to go, and then they will pick the count up, and uh, away we're going to go on that. The uh, last thing they've done is a little briefing. As you know, there is a sensor uh, that they elected not to change, and they have to bypass that, but they will see an alarm in the count on that. It's a pitch rate sensor and uh, it's not a constraint to launch but the flight director was just uh, or the launch director was just briefing everybody on that okay now discovery will be carrying the most densely packed scientific experimentation kit in the history of shuttle payloads some uh, 69 83 i'm sorry separate studies will gauge the effect of zero gravity and orbital sleep cycles on the human body can fast forward aging in space help science slow aging here on Earth. John Glenn himself will not be only a, a walking, breathing science experiment himself, but he'll actually help carry out some of the studies during Discovery's flight. 36 years ago, John Glenn was flying for survival. Now his flight is for science, but there's nothing tame about the rigors he'll go through. He's agreed to be pushed, poked, prodded, and plugged in before, during, and after the flight of Discovery because he knows what NASA has on him is solid gold. 40 years of medical information on a test subject perfectly suited for geriatric studies. Researchers have already identified some 50 side effects of life in zero gravity that mimic the aging process. Bones lose 1% of their density for each month aloft. Muscles begin rapid atrophy after only five days. The sense of balance becomes impaired, hearts shrink, and sleep becomes erratic. In space, where the stretch from sunrise to sunrise is 90 minutes, the body's circadian rhythms fly completely out of whack. So Glenn will be coated with electrodes to monitor his breathing and brain activity, rapid eye movement, and blood pressure. He'll swallow a series of pills the size of bottle caps that contain a tiny thermometer and transmitter to measure his internal chemistry and protein breakdown from one end of the digestive tract to the other. He'll give urine samples and 12 blood samples, which he's said to hate, and drawing blood in zero gravity can take an hour. And each morning, his mental agility, coordination, and mood will be measured in a computer test that would rival a killer video game. Why? Well, 75 million Americans are hurtling toward old age. 25 million of us suffer from osteoporosis. Millions more have sleep disorders. What scientists may learn about aging in space may help us reverse its effect on Earth. 
Glenn failed to meet the criterion for one of the main aging-related experiments, testing the effects of the natural hormone melatonin on sleep and daytime activities. But what is learned simply by observing Glenn and matching his readings against the younger astronauts may help medical science deliver to a population living a lot longer a far healthier and more productive life. While you'll hear plenty of talk about those experiments over the next nine days, you might not be as familiar with uh, some of the other things in the shuttle's payroll payload. Names such as Space Hab, Spartan, and Host will come up often. Neil Stein has details on what they're all about. While the Space Hab pressurized module will house more than 30 experiments that range from material science to plant growth, the gear back in the cargo bay will be working overtime. The International Extreme Ultraviolet Hitchhiker will be gauging ultraviolet outputs of stars to determine how fluctuations in ultraviolet rays affect, among other things, communications here on Earth. Its spectrographic telescope will be peering into extended plasma sources like the planet Jupiter. Another set of gears aimed at routine maintenance of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Host Orbiting Systems Test, designed to make sure new components for Hubble work before they get installed. The new cooling system and hard and software computer components will get road tested for radiation sensitivity and the kind of technical glitches, single event upsets they're called, that can occur up there. And there's the Spartan Free Flyer, which couldn't fly free or otherwise a year ago because of glitches in microgravity. STS-95 is going to try it again. The astronauts will deploy and then two days later retrieve a tiny satellite which will infiltrate the corona of the sun and measure solar winds to learn how they affect the weather here on Earth. When we come back, we're going to be talking to some people who knew John Glenn way back when. Welcome back to Harris Corporation's live digital HD TV coverage of the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. So far, the countdown has gone as smoothly as can be. And what's the status, Pete? Well, they've uh, gotten a go for the weather across the world, and so that's a go for launch. They've gotten their latest updates to the computer, and they've reconfigured their cockpit for launch. So we're getting closer. STS-95 is by far the highest visibility launch in NASA history. The media attention outstrips Mercury, even the Apollo missions. And no doubt the reason is John Herschel Glenn. Maybe because of his age, maybe because he was the first American in orbit, maybe because he's getting the chance to do it all over again. And so much is riding on this flight. Whatever it is, Glenn is a genuine hero. And if you uh, have that just look at all the signatures from admirers and well-wishers on this mural at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center. The space pioneers revered by many, and David Waterman reports that nowhere is there more admiration for his decency, for what he's accomplished, than the place where he grew up in central Ohio. New Concord lies among the rolling hillsides of Ohio, 70 miles east of Columbus, and right away you're reminded it's Glen country. Residents know all about his love for flying and how anxious he was to get his pilot training. In fact, uh, the stories are that he used to make uh, model planes and used to have his parents stop at airports to see the planes come and go. So when he got to uh, go to New Philly to take his training, that was an that was achievement for him. Reverend Harold Kaser is one of Glenn's best friends, played football with him at Muskingum College in New Concord. Glenn lettered in four sports and was an academic scholar, but Kaser also remembers him as a fun guy. In fact, uh, his father, I think, gave him an old, I forget the make of the car, and he loved to drive pretty fast. I, I think he burned out the bearings on one of the cars one time, and so John was grounded for about 30 days and uh, didn't have a car at all. Glenn still owns a house in this town of about 2,000 residents, his childhood home. Sits along Friendship Street, renamed for his space capsule. New Concord is where Glenn met a girl in grade school, Anna Margaret Castor, who would go on to become his wife. And each year he takes time from his busy schedule to come back to visit and to inspire students at the high school named in his honor. He just wanted to fly. He didn't know what he was going to be doing. And I think it's, uh, it helps me to know that when I, um, 
when I go for my goals that, that, that there are higher goals I can achieve, there are more things that I can do. It gives, lets me dream bigger because I know that someone from this small town can make it big. John Glenn's motivated me greatly and like for goal, like my goals and getting better at like powerlifting what I do. And I, it tells me that anything can be achieved. He can always be a, a testament to keeping in shape. Uh, he's 70, 76, 77. He's going back up into space and that's a very rigorous test. You have to be in excellent physical condition. So it's, it's definitely a, a motivation factor for our sports teams, I think. Some of our choir members are being selected to sing. And it's kind of a motivation to work harder in choir because there are only so many that we can take. So, and we all want to be a part of this. It's going on in our community because he's an American hero and we represent him. Godspeed, John Glenn. On February 20th, 1962, Muskingum College uh, held a special viewing, never done before, of the first television broadcast of a man going into space. Faculty and students alike watched and worried over their most famous alumnus. A kid named John Cole was one of those students sitting there 36 years ago. Now, astrophysicist Dr. John Cole, thank you for being with us. And today, you have a payload aboard Discovery. That's right. We have the Spartan satellite. It has two instruments inside, and we're hoping to see the astronauts deploy it and let it out for 45 hours and then bring it back in again and bring it back down to the ground. With some information about the corona of the sun. That's right. How much did your experience of sitting there watching that on television 36 years ago inform your decisions? Well, you have to imagine yourself being a young man or boy almost uh, Back in 1962, I don't think I'd ever been more than 50 miles out of Ohio, and suddenly someone that you know from a community that you live in, uh, son of people that you've seen, uh, is going as a national hero, is in this incredible international event, and it just does something to you. It gives you a feeling of a connection to the space program, and it opens up your horizons. It, ma it makes you uh, see the possibilities for your own career. Do you think that there are kids out there, even 20-somethings, even 30-somethings, who can watch this today and get a glimpse of their own possibilities? Well, let's hope so. Uh, it, uh, it's a subtle thing. It isn't something that just hits you right between the eyes, but you begin to feel after a while that, well, if that can be done by someone from New Concord, Ohio, why can't I do something interesting as well? You went to the same school with John, though not at the same time. That's right. Well, nearly 20 years difference in time. But he always uh, felt close to you for that, didn't he? Well, I don't know how he felt, but uh, I... I'm reminded uh, of the story of him calling Annie over, his wife, and saying he went to Muskingum College. Well, I had a, an occasion to meet him in June when uh, we familiarized the astronauts with our science and with our hardware. And we had an evening occasion where I had a chance to meet him for the first time, actually, last June. and. Uh, he, uh, after learning who I was and finding out that I was born 16 miles from New Concord and my family was from a little town called Coshocton, Ohio, uh, he then, I think, felt some kind of a kinship and, and took me over to meet his wife and, and let her know that, uh, that this fellow, he said, uh, was a student at Muskingum College when we orbited, he said, uh, to her. One gets the feeling he takes her with him wherever he goes. I think they're... Thank you very much, Dr. Cole. Okay. Glad you were with us. You know, Glenn's brains and bravery inspired another man who's covered America's new frontier from the pre-NASA proving grounds when everything was top secret right up through Challenger. He uh, studied and reported the way it was and has never lost his sense of wonder over rocketry and the lure of the heavens. He went on to report the exploration of space for years in all sorts of news programs, and for today's historic flight, he's uh, back in his old role. WRAL HD's David Crabtree caught up with him. Walter Cronkite is a journalist journalist. Lift off. Lift off. He's covered America's space struggles and successes for 40 years. History was made today, and you were an eyewitness. He always knew the value of telling a story in simple terms. I don't know any words for this except the trite ones. Tension is mounting here at Cape Canaveral. 
that's the way it was just before John Glenn's legendary shot into space 36 years ago. America's spirit and confidence had taken a serious hit when the Soviets made man's first gigantic leap into the unknown. We were in a state of near panic, and uh, Glenn's flight was very important. If it had failed, goodness knows what would have happened to, uh, to us uh, in our, as I say, our national psyche. We'd have kind of mentally blown our brains out. It was Cronkite who led millions of us through the tense seconds just before Friendship 7's engines ignited. Zero, ignition, lift off. When you could finally see the rocket's red glare, you could feel the veteran CBS anchor's emotion. Looks like a good flight, all oh, go, baby. The Glenn flight was tremendously significant. Uh, it, 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 uh, it helped to begin to reestablish uh, the American confidence in ourselves. It would also lead to what Walter Cronkite describes as the most significant moment of the 20th century, the afternoon of July 21st, 1969. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 500 years from now, however people are learning, whether by books or osmosis or whatever, uh, I think uh, young people will be learning the date that man landed on the moon. Cronkite is working again, covering Glenn's historic second mission, this time for CNN. At age 80, he's watching a man only three years younger, taking the trip he dreamed about for years. How disappointing was it that you did not get a chance to fly in space? Oh, I suppose I'd say the ultimate disappointment. He was the leading candidate for the Journalist in Space program, but his real goal, the moon. Uh, I think that would be the ultimate, to uh, get out there and walk on a distant orb and, and be able to look back and see this blue, this blue globe that is the, the, the world. Walter Cronkite knows his time for space travel has passed but his passion for humans to explore unknown worlds is as strong as ever. Space and the oceans are two great frontiers. We're just touching the surface, just, just barely breaking the surface with this. We're just getting our toe in the edge of the ocean. Uh, we haven't even gotten up to our ankles yet. The moon is not NASA's main focus right now. The next task is constructing an orbital outpost, the International Space Station. Over my uh, right shoulder, you've been seeing, looming in the great distance on pad 39B, the shuttle Discovery. Over the other shoulder, just a little bit away, is pad 39A, and the shuttle Endeavour is standing there, ready to go. It's going to launch the beginning of what has been a seriously delayed project, but it's finally going to get underway later this year when Endeavour goes up. Coming up, a look at the status of the space station program. Welcome back to Harris Corporation's live digital HD TV coverage of the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. Here's how the countdown is shaping up right now. We have been on a 10 minute uh, built in hold and we're going to be coming out of it in just about a minute. Why well, do they build in these now. holes? I just heard they're going to hold. So, uh, Why do they build in these holes? So they can, they, the first one is so if there's anything uh, gotten a little bit slow, they have a little chance to catch up. It doesn't mean something happened, it just means the crew maybe got a, or the closeout crew or somebody got a little bit behind. So they bring you right down, they take that hold, they get everything squared away, then they go into the next segment and they're into the final hold now and when they pick it up, at this point it goes into the automatic sequence. It's all on auto counting down for launch. And uh, what's happened right now though is they do have a discussion going on about a little problem and uh, so they are going to hold. So we won't go off right exactly at two, but they don't expect it to be very long. We're going to get back to what that problem is in just a moment. But, you know, it has not been an easy, a busy year here for shuttle launches. And uh, 
That has created concerns that this mission is riskier than normal. Launch crews can lose their edge. Equipment box procedures get rusty. You know, it's been nearly five months since a space shuttle left uh, the Kennedy Space Center. That's the longest time between liftoff attempts since the recovery from the 1986 Challenger disaster, which put all launches on hold for more than two years. The explosion of Challenger and the loss of its seven crew members reminded us all how complicated it is to put a shuttle into space and how easily things can go so wrong. This orbiter, has 230 miles of wiring, 417 circuit breakers, 600 fuses, 950 switches, and 2 million parts, more than half of which are designed to move. And then there are the twin rocket boosters, booster rockets. In fact, it was one of those that leaked the flames which caused the Challenger to explode. Liftoff of these complex, dangerous flying machines is difficult enough when the launch crew is well rehearsed. But what about when there's a, been a five month gap between takeoffs. This is a very serious concern right now, but they have done uh, laid on extra emergency drills, procedural drills. Shuttle launches have decreased in part this year, of course, because of the growing delays in the International Space Station program. The road toward assembling that space outpost has been a rocky one. It's been called the most complex and expensive engineering project in world history, the $50 billion space station construction. Critics of the project argue that the Reagan administration estimated it would cost only about $8 billion when it was proposed in 1984, but overruns, poor program management, and schedule delays have swelled its price tag by nearly seven times. And now, another cash crisis. Russia's continuing economic problems are threatening construction and launch of the crucial service module, which is supposed to be launched early next year. Just last week, Congress approved a plan to give Russia a $60 million bailout to keep the work on track. While NASA tries desperately to fund the project, workers here at Kennedy Space Center continue on as if nothing's wrong. Yeah, the problems uh, primarily are, are political. The technical problems, we're working those out. Uh, they want to worry about the money. Uh, that is a problem. Uh, my concern and those of us here in, in this facility is we're getting it done technically correct. Our working relationship with the Russians when they've come here is fantastic. John Coward, a project manager at the Space Station Processing Facility at Kennedy Space Center, says the relationship the U.S. has with Russia is very important. Well, as a, a former member of the military who was trained uh, during the Cold War, it's really been interesting and I'm glad to see. I think everybody, uh, the world is better for it. Unity, a connecting node that will be launched into orbit in December aboard shuttle Endeavour, was placed into Endeavour's payload bay just last week. Coward says this portion, which will connect the power supply module with the engine module, is symbolic of the whole station effort. Coming together of the old Cold War allies, the United States and Russia, and in a combined effort, uh, it's really interesting to go to a meeting on the International Space Station sometimes, and kind of tough, because you may see as many as four different languages that have to be translated back and forth on some very technical details. But unity represents, like I said, the coming together of our two nations in this one united effort. The United States and its 15 partners are hoping to have the orbiting outpost built by the year 2004 and will need 34 shuttle missions, nine unmanned rocket flights, and 144 astronauts spacewalks to accomplish the construction work. Proponents of the station say the work will be worth it. Numerous scientific and engineering breakthroughs will result from the experiments that will be done on board. Breakthroughs, they say, that will make life back here on Earth better. Obviously, it's a tremendous sense of pride that you've uh, been a part of the very first part of the International Space Station. So uh, everybody here can take a great deal of pride in what they've done. This is a, it's a beautiful spaceship and it's ready to fly. Before NASA moves into space station construction mode, they've got to get this bird off the ground. Discovery's ready. We are minutes away from launch. We'll be right back. We're continuing with Harris Corporation's live digital HD TV coverage of the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery, hereinafter referred to as the Glenn Flight. And we are minutes away from launch, but we are on 
hold right now. Pete Conrad, former astronaut. They're, Tell they're, us why they're holding. They're just getting ready to pick it up. They get the little uh, problem resolved. It was a matter of who saw what. And it had to do with the master alarm, which we all knew was going to happen. But uh, they had a little discussion about it. So they've just now run around all of the functions and uh, best I could tell is everybody is go so they're gonna pick up the, the, the T minus nine here pretty quickly. When you talk about who saw what we should tell people that the firing room is here at the Kennedy Space Center on the coast of Florida. Mission Control is at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. They right. are also monitoring simultaneously what's going on here. So uh, that said a little bit about what the discussion was about. Everybody saw everything, but they wanted to agree that they all saw the same thing. And uh, they finally got that resolved. Um, I remember uh, when uh, I think it was uh, Gemini 5, our uh, flight uh, was the first one when instead of uh, having the ops here at the Cape where we launched from was the first time they switched mission control to Houston right after launch. So uh, that was a long time ago, 1965. You know what amazes me about the Mercury and Gemini men and women who put those things into space? <laughs> they built those machines before the advent of the silicon chip. You guys must have been geniuses. No, I don't think we were geniuses. We just didn't have the chip, so we had to do without. <laughs> Figure out another way to do it. Right? That's right. That was the old way of doing it. Now they do it the new way. Did you have any input in the design of the early space shuttles? Well, uh, it, oh, the shuttle. No, I was uh, gone by the, actually I was uh, flying Skylab at the time and then I left, uh, I retired. So I didn't really have any big inputs into the shuttle. I, mo most of the work I did. We're gonna check in now, Pete, with, uh, is it Mission Control in Houston? Not yet. This is launch, launch control here at the Kennedy Space Center. Is that correct? Negative. Copy that. And attention all stations. Countdown clock will resume momentarily. Okay, they're getting ready to resume. CLS NCD, pick up the count on your mark. CLS copy. Countdown clock will resume on my mark. Three, two, one, one. mark. Let's go. Now and we're now at auto. T minus nine minutes and counting. T minus. We heard NASA test director. Doug Lyons conduct a poll of the launch team. Also, Ralph Rowe, launch director, conducting a poll of his team. And uh, Dominic McMonagall also giving the input from the mission management team, also located here in the firing room. All systems are go for the launch of the shuttle Discovery. Looking for an on-time liftoff. Pete, at Correction, two minutes nine, the clock down yeah, is uh, running, and this is when everything goes into the autopilot mode, that's right? That's correct. Explain it to us. Well, uh, it's going to be auto checking all of the functions very rapidly, making sure everything stays in sequence. It's starting the automatic sequences that are necessary to start the engines, the final chill downs of the engines and all of those things, the hydraulics, that everything's up to speed. The uh, vehicle is now on its, on its own internal power, so they want to make sure all of that stuff is uh, providing what it's supposed to. And uh, so in order that nobody makes a mistake or something goes out of limits, it's all done automatically. So the commanders and pilots strapped into that uh, shuttle 95 feet above the ground right now, notwithstanding, the computers are going to handle this launch. Yeah. When the clock down, when the countdown clock started just a moment ago, there was a big applause and roar here at the media center. On an average launch, uh, they expect to give out about 400 credentials. As of two days ago, they were already at 3,800. Yeah. There are 50 satellite trucks. Pete, I have covered major events all over the world, and I don't remember an event that is, it has uh, had this much interest, both nationally and internationally. One would think this was, at least for because of John Glenn, a uniquely American experience, but it's not just America who's interested. Why do you think that is? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with John being on the flight. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's focused everybody's back on onto the shuttle. 
uh, let's face it, one of the things you were always going to have happen is uh, the more we flew in space, it became more routine. You don't cover airliner taking off anymore. Uh, matter of fact, one of the things I mentioned is uh, that happened right when uh, we had gone to the moon was they transplanted the first heart. And uh, now you don't hear about people transplanting hearts anymore either. It's a routine thing that happens. So space in some sense is, is uh, some bit, uh, uh, I'm just hearing you're gonna hold again, okay. Okay, I'm gonna let you listen to the hold okay. while I explain what's been going on overnight. Okay. Late last night in the wee hours and under the cover of darkness, they moved the giant service module, it looks like an erector set that enshrouded the space shuttle all this time, the actual bird, while they were working on it. Um, once that was done, at about 5.40 this morning before the sun rose, they started fueling that giant main tank. It's the orange tank that the shuttle is now cozied up to there and strapped onto. The two white tanks on either side are the solid rocket boosters. The orange tank is fueled by 500,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen from a tank to the extreme right of the shuttle and liquid oxygen from a tank to the extreme left of the shuttle. It's piped in under the ground. The um, temperature of the fuel inside, a combustible combination if there ever was, is uh, held at 123 degrees below zero Fahrenheit during the entire time it's sitting in that main tank. And uh, so that's a tricky process. Do you see the tanks? The, there's a white sort of node, a bump to the extreme right of the picture. That's liquid hydrogen. To the left, that's liquid oxygen. Running perpendicular to that line between the two fuel tanks are what they call flame trenches. When the shuttle takes off, the three main engines are going to generate energy equal to 23 Hoover dams. Imagine the thrust of that uh, that energy as this takeoff happens. Fire, as you've all seen before, comes flying out of the, from the uh, bottom of the tank and goes through those flame trenches so that it doesn't burn the environment. About an hour and a half ago, Commander Brown himself was uh, strapped into the flight deck of Shuttle Discovery. Pete, tell me what the strapping process is all about. I, I was just, Oh, okay. He's uh, he's strapping in. He doesn't have his helmet on. He is going to be. Uh, he he is wearing a parachute. Um, this was something they added after the Challenger accident, um, and so he is getting put in. He will have to be strapped in uh, with a full suspension harness, you know, shoulder harness, and, and and be all tied down. We talked about that a little earlier. Shake, rattle, and roll. You don't want to have your feet flinging around somewhere. So they, they uh, get them all bolted in so that they're good and secure. And I did want to comment, the reason for the hold right now is there is an aircraft has wandered into the area that he isn't supposed to be in. And so they are out shooing him out of the area and I'd say he's in serious trouble. I would think so. The reason for clearing airspace and ocean space on the water uh, before a shuttle is uh, that there, about two minutes into flight, two solid rocket boosters, by then devoid of fuel because it's burned up by then, fall free into the ocean. They don't want to hit anyone with those. And of course, airspace always has to be cleared. That's right, and as I said, I think that fellow's in deep trouble right now. What is, is it like inside the shuttle for Commander Brown and the others as they take off? What is the sensation that the astronauts feel? Well, realize he's, uh, uh, they're all a long way up from the engines, and when, that, when the uh, engines light, they'll, they'll feel it and they'll hear it. Uh, of course, the other thing is, is once those solids light, you're on your way. And so they get the engines up and running. You're gonna have a little shaking as it's holds right there. And then they light those solids and away you go. Um, and then it gets to be a smooth ride because you're not being held down. And uh, you get this, you're gonna get a little bobble going through uh, the max Q region, which is where you get the most air pressure on the, on the vehicle going out. And that occurs around 35,000 feet. Uh, as they get up past 
that point, uh, you wind up uh, getting smoother and smoother. And of course, one of the things you're leaving behind is any sound. And one of the things you're you flying learn faster about than the speed of is, sound. Well, one of the things you learn about space, it's really quiet up there. Eerie. Eerie you know, we, we look at these seven going up as heroes, doing it all by themselves. Let me tell you that there's a standing army of 14,000 people here at the Kennedy Space Center and a lot more out in Houston who have worked on preparing for this flight. It has taken a lot. I want to show you some of the preparations involved. costs about $400 million and spans more than six months in some cases. Kind of like flying a 747, only a thousand times more complicated. For example, the crew has to train for many months, learning intense scientific experiments, practicing intricate spacewalks, and mastering such tasks as evacuating a potentially explosive shuttle at the pad, something that's never actually been done before. In fact, for that, the crew actually has to drive what's known as an M113 that's similar to a tank intended to protect them as they dash away from a possible explosion. At least one astronaut once joked it was strange being required to drive a tank before learning how to drive a shuttle. Speaking of driving, a monstrous vehicle known as the Crawler Transporter is used to ferry the shuttle out to the pad during the latter stages of launch preparation. Now, this is no ordinary vehicle. It has a top speed of about two miles an hour. It's the heaviest in the world, weighing in at a whopping 18 million tons with a shuttle balanced on top. Certainly wouldn't want to change a tire. Each one of these uh, tread segments weighs one ton, and there's 57 in each belt. So you start multiplying times two belts per corner, that turns out to be a lot of tonnage just in the treads themselves. Ms. Shabrak, one of the handful of drivers for the two transporters, says the dashboard is a little different than in your average vehicle on the roads. Here you have your uh, shifter, basically forward and reverse. You have your accelerator. You turn this knob to go faster. Over here, we have our speedometer. It only goes a little over one mile an hour. Our steering wheel. You can only turn either six degrees to the left or to the right. It's not a real big wheel, but it gets the job done. Intricate preparations continue once the shuttle reaches the pad. The fueling alone takes about eight hours as more than a half million gallons of highly volatile propellants are pumped into the large orange fuel tank. One of the most hazardous operations and most time critical. If we delay too long in getting started, we won't have time to meet the beginning of the launch window. Amazingly, all the hundreds of thousands of gallons of super coal fuel get used up in just a few minutes during the launch. No, it lasts about eight minutes, a little over eight minutes. Uh, you're actually uh, using that propellant up at almost 60,000 gallons a minute, equivalent of, say, filling your swimming pool, filling three swimming pools a minute for that eight minutes of flight. Other preparations for crew members include floating deep underwater to simulate the weightlessness of space, being continuously poked and prodded during dozens of physicals, and spending hours practicing using the shuttle's toilet, which is not all that easy to master. Given the high visibility and massive preparation of this launch and the, we can tell you, intense security involved around all of Kennedy Space Center and its airspace, Pete, it is surprising that there is an errant aircraft up there that has put this entire launch on halt. But like I said, he's in a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, and they're working on getting him out of the area. But uh, I wouldn't want to be him. Well, he buzzes as he buzzes around up there with uh, fighter jets or whatever it is they send after him right now. Uh, I want to talk about the impact of the launch here on the ground. We know that it's a little rugged inside the space capsule. 36 years ago, John Glenn was pulling 7.9 Gs of uh, G-forces when he went up, which would have made him feel for a little while as though he weighed 1,728 pounds. Today, they're better at it. They pull about three G-forces, which is still impressive, right? But outside, when the shuttle goes off, the sound is so loud that I want to give you an example of, of uh, how it's going to feel. This is a shot from our high-definition camera out at the launch pad. It is 300 yards from the pad, just 300 yards. It's a robotic camera. The reason that we don't have a man operating that camera out there is that on launch, he would be killed from the impact of the sound wave. 
The sound roars out of those engines at 150 decibels. We do have another camera. We were allowed to put one up at uh, the top of the observation tower. Our cameraman, Paul, is up there. He, in order to be able to man that camera, had to take a NASA physical and pass it. There's the observation tower, and Paul is there. He had to take a NASA physical. He has to wear a special suit and a respirator because the toxicity of the fumes, if only briefly, coming out of those engines is so strong that it could seriously impair him or worse. The next shot we have is up at the top of this massive monolith, the vehicle assembly building there, where these shuttles, as they are reusable, are flown back inside, put in there, and taken apart chip by chip, tile by tile, and piece by piece before they're allowed to go back up again. And that's the shot you see from the top of the vehicle assembly building. Now, you will see a water tower just barely to the right, do you see it, of the um, space shuttle discovery there. That is filled with a half a million gallons of water. It's called the deluge system. And on launch, that launch pad is deluged with half a million gallons of water to suppress the sound. The sound, nonetheless, is still very dangerous close up, which is why it's so important that the closed crews are out of there an hour before the launch. They're going to pick up the count very quickly. They've got it clear. They're going to pick it up momentarily, and they're shooting for uh, uh, two zero after the hour for our liftoff. Okay. The clock should have just started. There you go. And the APUs are started. So we are uh, going to go here. CDR, as you see, reconfigure heaters. CDR, copy heater, reconfigure and work. That is the firing room. Yep, right. and they're uh, in the final go. The APU is And as you see, heater reconfig is complete. They're uh, doing their last little T minus four minutes, 30 seconds. And they just completed that. T minus 40 minutes and 30 seconds, less than 30 seconds now. They're in automatic. They are in these. automatic. Have you seen an indication they have a good start? OTC, PLT, APU start is complete, three in the green. Copy that. Okay, they have three green. They completed the start on the APUs. They're all up to speed. T-minus four minutes and counting. So it is looking good. Now you see the, uh, the uh, liquid oxygen uh, coming out of uh, chilling the engines down, down there at Final the base. Final sequence of the main engines will mm. begin in about 30 seconds. Uh, and then you're going to see the, the final chill. Why do they have to chill the engines? They have to get them cold. That uh, that propellant is extremely cold. It's uh, the hydrogen's of minus 400 and something degrees Fahrenheit cold. And uh, LOX is minus 200 and 60 or something uh, cold. So you gotta you gotta chill the engine down to fire it up. Does that make sense? <laughs> Absolutely, because if that engine in this hot Florida sunshine gets hit with that kind of temperature, yeah. it's going to crack in half. Okay, now, what is happening here? Something. Okay, they, got, they just went through their little uh, failure. Again, this was the issue we described earlier, this glitch known condition. that they were going to skip, and they've skipped it. They've gone through that. Uh, I think Just we're an getting ready to lift that, uh, was providing inaccurate data. The nose cover off. Verify no unexpected errors. Copy that and work. The feeling there here at go. the Kennedy two Space mile. Center is electric. Very shortly. Very shortly, that arm is going to come MPLC off. It's actually. Uh, Break, break, NPDSR on 212. Very slowly. Yes, sir, uh, we will need to hold the on range is no-go. The we, uh, range is no-go again. I copy that, and we'll again. hold it T-minus 31 seconds, and be advised our hold time there is 5 minutes and 18 seconds. Uh oh, you can range hold for again, 5 minutes. 5 minutes, 18 seconds. Somehow the range got fouled again. OTC, PLT, caution warning, clear, no expected errors. Stop. Countdown okay. clock will be holding. At 30 the seconds. The superintendent of range operations announcer is uh, remove the hold in association with our engine two pitch and insert a hold at T minus 31 seconds due to the range. 
Pete, can you interpret that for us? Yes, the range got fouled again. Some somehow there's another aircraft or or a ship or something that's uh, in the wrong place. And uh... normally, the launch window is about five minutes. It's in, in any case very brief. Today's launch window is two and a half hours, which is unusually long. So this uh, mission can sustain a series of holds for a while, but there's a point beyond which... Ranges go again. They just gave them a go, so maybe they'll keep on going. Please remove the hold at T-minus 31. The clock is moving, Pete. It's now yeah. T-minus one minute and counting. They're not going to hold. They're going to go. They just got it clear. All systems are go. All systems have been reported go for launch of Discovery. Less than one minute away now from the historic return of John Glenn to space. I copy and attention all stations. The countdown clock will continue. Countdown clock will continue, so we're going to go right through that 30-second mark and keep on going. John Glenn is sandwiched in the mid-deck, the cheap seats with no windows on this uh, launch. Discovery's on board computers now have control of vehicle Sorry. functions. T minus 20 min 20 seconds. All right. T minus 15. Now let's start the uh, about minus seven seconds. T minus 10. Engine start. Nine. Now you see the eight. Is on. We have a go for engine start. There Five. You go. There's the main Four. Engines. Three. Two. One. Booster ignition there and liftoff of Discovery for the crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. And a ball of fire. Roger roll, Discovery. Yep, they got a roll. into the flight discovery now at an altitude of 25 miles traveling at a speed of 2,900 miles an hour the next event will be burnout and separation of discovery's twin solid rocket boosters Susan still informing the crew that in the event of a single engine Discovery failure. Discovery Houston, performance nominal. Copy, copy, performance nominal. Discovery could now reach the transatlantic abort site at Banjul. However, telemetry indicating all three engines continuing to perform well. And Discovery's performance to this point, two and a half minutes into the flight, has been as expected. Discovery now traveling at a speed of 3,500 miles per hour at an altitude of 43 miles. Downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 70 miles. All systems are continuing to perform well. That cloud's going to miss us, isn't it? It's still there, aren't they? Three minutes into the flight, Discovery now traveling at a speed of 3,850 miles per hour, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center at a distance of 86 miles. Just about five minutes of powered flight remaining on board.
three minutes and 40 seconds into the flight. Discovery now traveling at a speed of 4,600 miles per hour. Downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, just about 135 miles. Telemetry indicating that all systems on board Discovery are... Discovery Houston, negative return. return. Discovery Houston, negative return. 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 And with that call, Discovery is now too far downrange and has gained too much altitude to return to the Kennedy Space Center in the event of an engine failure. Discovery Houston, press to ATO. Discovery copies, press to ATO. And Discovery could now reach orbit on two engines should one fail. However, telemetry continues to indicate that all three main engines are performing at 104% of rated thrust as expected. Four minutes, 21 seconds into the flight, just about four more minutes of powered flight remaining. Discovery traveling at a speed of 5,700 miles per hour. Downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 200 miles. Seconds. It was a picture-perfect launch and this giant pillar of smoke behind us, testament to it. In uh, less than 30 seconds, the main engines will cut off. They will get into deep space, eight minutes from the point of launch, just about eight minutes, and they'll be traveling up there at 300 nautical miles up, nearly twice the, the height that John Glenn reached 36 years ago. Five minutes into and the mission. And they'll be Three traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, faster than the speed of sound, Pete. Okay, they're pressed the main engine cutoff. And that call means that Discovery could now reach a safe orbit on two engines, should one fail. Can, All three main uh, engines are continuing engine to perform. And, uh, reach a safe orbit on two. What you're hearing is that there's no threat, particularly right. that they're going they're, to lose They're just any passing engines, those points. They, Everything's not. They have off. lots of points of no return, and in fact, they have three transatlantic abort sites if they have to abort. No, uh, they're, they're, they're past that. So they can't even do that anymore. Right, they're going to make We're not it. seeing these guys right. for nine days. You got it. <laughs> they're up there and gone. Now, just watch your monitor. I want you to see who the blast off did not frighten. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a member of NASA's self, uh, stealth security force. There are alligators the size of Cadillacs all around the launch pad. And yesterday, when we were out there, this guy was two miles from the blast off. We were out there uh, at the launch pad yesterday. He's probably seen every And launch. I saw my first live <laughs> alligator. I had no idea they grew them so big down here, but they are the security force. And as a matter of fact, it was so interesting to be studying this technology and building this high definition television stage here in front of this beautiful lagoon with a manatee behind it. Very few people know that the Kennedy Space Center also houses a beautiful and vast wildlife refuge. Let's replay that wonderful moment again when a man who was a hero turned into a legend. See the sparks? That's to make sure none of the hydrogen, they burn the hydrogen off. That white piece you saw fall off a piece of ice because when they chill those engines down, it makes the air so cold, the air freezes. So what you were seeing was liquid air, ice falling off. Look at that. Those are the flames going through flame trenches. The smoke that you see there is from those. And when they've described a pillar of fire, I've seen it on television a hundred times, or maybe 92, I have never seen it like this. Here's the countdown clock. This is from our launch pad robotic camera. And a beautiful liftoff for the 25th flight of the shuttle Discovery. So much preparation goes into this, and the astronauts don't get to just sit there on the flight deck and look out the windows. They're pretty darn busy now, and they will be for some time, even though uh, everything's on automatic still and for the first eight minutes, right, Pete? Right, and from my perspective, the only problem was I'm not on it. <laughs> That's right. I'm a little jealous myself. <laughs> There you go. You know, uh, they're just about uh, there. Where are we here on that clock? Six minutes and 30. They got about another two minutes. And They've now leave. reached the point. 
OK, they've now reached they've reached the point where they're going to they're going to make it all the way uh, to orbit to the nominal orbit now. They have the capacity once they're at orbit to use thrusters to uh, correct their trajectory. If yes, they what they to. actually do is they uh, they uh, aren't quite in a true orbit. Uh, you notice there's a burn scheduled 45 minutes after they get in to uh, after the engines cut off, and that circularizes their orbit to the uh, 300 miles that they're going to. You know, for all the power and thrust it takes to get this thing to escape the, the bonds of Earth, when it comes back in for landing in nine days, it comes in on no power. This is what, in effect, will be a 228-pound brick with wings that turns into a glider. So the commander, Kurt Brown, and pilot Steve Lindsay are going to have to land this thing without any opportunity to say, abort landing, we'll go around and try it again. This is that's it. They've right. got one shot on getting Once it down in the right down, place. you're on your way home. And the thing that's so amazing about watching them land is that they set it down like a United Airlines flight 727. You know, they uh, I don't know if you know how they do the training, but they have two Gulf Streams configured for, uh, they, they can make them fly like the shuttle. And they go out here to uh, White Sands and uh, they've got all the desert out there and they've got some runways that's also an abort site discovery houston will be sending up on two targets with the updated ht that landing uh in those uh, okay we're talking you're going to send up the updated when right. you're coming back in and so you want to make sure you do it right of course the simulator is very good you realize that the world in the simulation world has improved tremendously from our day when i uh, when I uh, landed on the moon, all we had was black and white television of a, of a camera coming down looking at a plaster of Paris mold of the moon, see? And so uh, the first time you really got to see what it was you were doing for real was when was you got to the moon. And uh, what we had to do was fly a device called the Lunar Landing Training Vehicle. And uh, that's how we practiced to make the landing on the moon. And that was the hairiest machine in the program. It only had five minutes of fuel in it. We wiped out three of the four that we had. <laughs> so uh, when you got ready to go to the moon, landing on it was a piece of cake if you'd gotten through that lunar landing training vehicle. Pete Conrad, working with you is a piece of cake. Thank you very <laughs> much for being with us today. They did it. You saw it on high definition television. And what we witnessed here today is a triumph of technology and teamwork and dogged optimism. The next generation is already in the ready room, waiting to launch a permanent space station into the sky. Those guys will drive unimaginable new technologies that will extend our reach and vision back to the birth of the universe and far into its future. Perhaps the reason the nation is so fired up about this flight of discovery is that it kind of puts a button on an entire era in space exploration, from Alan Shepard and John Glenn through the top guns of Mercury and Apollo to the shuttle runners. They all delivered. They made it look easy. They were so good we could easily forget that men and women work so hard and risk so much in these fantastically dangerous machines to reach beyond human limitation. And if there is a monument to this era, it's John Glenn, a guy who never did consider it unusually courageous to uh, chase his dreams, who never did lose his sense of wonder. You know, whatever we may learn from him about aging, he's already taught us much about growing old. 36 years ago, the head of the manned space program said, uh, this is but the end of the beginning. Can't say it better than that today. This has been but the end of the beginning. For all the men and women who put together this very complicated, high definition approach to television that you've seen today for Pete Conrad, I'm Mary Alice Williams. Thank you for being with us.